Good evening. Hello, everyone. We are back after some more time. We have sort of been away for a while. But today we bring to you some really interesting topic and a very interesting personality as well. So JS Institute of Design brings to you uh, another webinar by Discover Design on understanding landscape design with oracles. Now let me remind you, Discover Design is a series of webinar which informs you about design. Specifically, we have been talking a lot about interior space, uh, but today's topic is outside that interior space on landscaping. Uh, Discover Design is going to answer a lot of questions about what design is, the house of design, how does it take place, what are the processes, uh, why does it happen, and perhaps many other questions that you may have been looking for in the area of design. Today, our topic is on landscape design, and our speaker today is Sunit Mohendro. Welcome, Sunit. Really so happy to have you with us. Thank you, Nian. Thank you so much. Uh, let me give you a few lines about what Sunit has done. Very interesting. He's a graduate from School of Planning and Architecture, New Delhi, and a former Charles Wallace Fellow at D. Montfort University, UK. He's, also, he's a practicing architect and a landscape design expert. And that's why I think he would be able to relate architecture with landscape when he talks about it. He co-heads oracles and plural design consultants. His two allied firms involved in multidisciplinary architectural practice. He's also very involved with education. So um, he's a professor, visiting professor at the Department of Architecture and the Department of Urban Design, SPA New Delhi, and serves as the advisor to the Department of Landscape Architecture at VIT's PVP College of Architecture in Pune. Uh, today, uh, I, let me just give you a very quick intro to what he would be talking about, but uh, I hope you'll listen to it very carefully and note down all your questions in the Q&A section of the um, of the, the Q&A function of the uh, webinar, and we will take up the questions at the end of the seminar. So he'll talk to us about what, what the term landscape means and landscape architecture, what's the difference? Uh, he would also be talking about inspirations and our points of contact with landscape. What is the difference between garden, landscape, and nature? I think all of us sort of use it really uh, interchangeably, but as a technical expert, there are a lot of things he wants to inform us today. Uh, he would be talking about landscape architecture as a multidisciplinary engagement between science, art, and engineering. So yes, it's not just all about beauty and aesthetics. There's a lot of science, technicality, and engineering involved. Uh, he would also be talking about his views on landscape practice and teaching. So welcome, Sunit. Um, may I invite you to start with whatever you want to tell us. Um, so we are ready to listen to you. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you for uh, having a platform like this where uh, impressive uh, seekers can come in and uh, really celebrate the world of design. And uh, it's, uh, an honor to be uh, part of this and be with you all so that uh, I also uh, enhance uh, the repertoire of uh, whatever all of us together are doing in the world of design. So uh, I would quickly uh, share some, uh, a short presentation rather to uh, kind of incite certain questions uh, in your mind. And uh, this presentation is uh, really, uh, really a collection of, uh, I would say it's, it's about my passion and engagement with the discipline. And uh, that is what I wanted to share with you. Uh, are you able to see the full screen or are, uh, is there that black band containing all of us appearing on the side? Um, I think I can see all of it. 
Okay. And also, Sunit, if you could uh, speak a little closer to the uh, audio, to the mic, yes. we will be, yes. be able to hear you better. Okay. So, uh, now, what is landscape and what is architecture and how do the two come together? That's a very important starting point to really understand what we are uh, speaking about today. And uh, why this thing comes to us is because uh, long back when we were uh, when we were primarily uh, people of the soil we were never divorced from our setting but more so with development it's happening that our whole essence of life is moving culturally away from nature and this is what has caused so many upheavals so uh, naturally there is a renewed interest in getting back to our roots. And that is where landscape being the most humble of uh, professions where uh, one deals with uh, natural uh, material and delves in, into nature is something that would be interesting to know about. So on one, one hand, landscape design is really uh, something like an instrument, you know, to uh, reorient therefore our relationship to nature. So our urbanism, our cities, and the ecology, the natural uh, phenomena. How do we relate the two together? How, how, how do we develop a synergy? And uh, naturally, it is also a tool to foster a meaningful art, you know, because uh, nature itself has art, and our outdoors are something that can invigorate our senses. So how do we meaningfully engage in this art so that nature becomes stylistically a part of our living arena and also of course because landscape provides a setting for our lives so it is something that would naturally perpetuate culture so uh, while loosely we may say that landscape refers to uh, you know land and, and its features it, any scenery or an expanse is something which we would uh, often call landscape and uh, any, you know, so that's one way of looking at it. That's how a dictionary would talk about. But uh, UNESCO once came out with the, one of the best uh, definitions of landscape, which says that it's the combined work of nature and man. So it is something which is natural and something which is engaged by the human being. And that is why it becomes the combined work of nature and man. Mm. Now, while that is landscape, architecture is, as you all know, about organizing, about being able to stitch together, bring together, and then create. So it is putting together of components to create space, to, 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 to create a design. And landscape architecture, therefore, would mean that we are looking at creating design, we are looking at creating an outdoor environment where its form and essence derives from nature, both naturally and stylistically. So on one hand, you know that landscape in itself, therefore, is nature, ecology, or the setting wherever we are. At the same time, even uh, the basic engagement of cultivation, of orchards, of plantation, it, it all comes under what we refer to as landscape. And uh, more so our cities where we reside, our, our settings where we live out our lives are also included in urbanism, streetscapes, parks, etc., where uh, landscape comes into picture. Another interesting way to understand landscape is our cultural past. So when we, when we look at historical settings, then we are naturally, uh, naturally getting introduced to responses of human beings at different times culturally to their natural environment. Societies and nature, these come alive when we see natural. So we feel so happy when we go to uh, historical com complexes. We, we feel elated, elevated. We feel, uh, you know, a sense of identity there. We enjoy those. Why do we enjoy those? Because the stitching together of 
the setting and the building is something which brings uh, the whole drama alive it is also about infrastructure so when we talk talk about roads when we talk about bridges aqueducts tunnels uh, even retention ponds uh, lakes everything is it is a part of infrastructure that stitches landscape together and then i would also want you to really understand this fact that garden in one sense is something that is an art which tends to be a two dimensional way of creating a pattern on the ground and thereby saying that yes this is my idea of what my nature my setting should be so it is a human ideation mm -hmm. which gets inspired from nature and gets created in nature Correct. whereas when we look at our existence and we just look around we would find that there are so many phenomena that in themselves are so artistic that it invigorates our senses and then we use those as inspirations to create landscape so landscape itself is an art and right. of course uh, Wait, you know, before yes. you go on i i was just reminded of frank lloyd wright's falling water yes where the whole environment uh, inspired him to build the house with the waterfall as the main you know main focus absolutely uh, does that mean that he didn't want to uh, as an architect of course he may not have wanted to change anything but as a landscape art uh, architect would you think of such a project and probably do something different to it so you see uh, falling waters is nothing but a very basic response to something that we live in and enjoy on our daily basis with regards to nature in right. fact the image that you see on this page at the bottom right is taken from a little niche kind of a cave looking outwards and the water is falling from above so i am standing inside and this picture is looking towards the larger uh, landscape outside and what kind of a joy i can't express uh i i had when i sat into this little cave and felt that my wall was semi transparent it was about this falling water so when we start to think about building design as something that emulates the processes of nature and therefore create a form that enables us to express how we feel about heights about water about plants about the whole natural setting then the building and the setting become one and it is this oneness that brings about timelessness a feeling of joy a feeling of uh, uh, being engaged with our setting so uh, yes it is a celebrated piece and uh, whenever we in fact design today we begin by understanding its context and try and get a narrative which stitches our own philosophical thought about that context what is physically there mm -hmm. what is surrounding what is the uh, intangible or philosophical uh, uh, you know uh, philosophical uh, engagement that we can have with that time and space which we can bring into it so yes it's a very very interesting uh, field yes look forward to more yeah so uh, as i said that landscape is also where culture fosters so naturally uh, art is something which is uh, dependent on its settings now here i say something very uh, uh, important which uh, we should kind of bear in mind when we think about landscape that landscape itself we may say that is an expression of life it is nature it is culture it has rhythm because there are seasons it has ceaseless continuum because it 
begins from evolu uh, evolution of land, erosive processes keep happening, landform keeps evolving, forests keep changing. So nature changes. And when we talk of landscape design, then the created landscape lies in landscape. So landscape lies in landscape. What I'm trying to say is there is a several range, there are several ranges of scales that are operative when we think about landscape. It doesn't end somewhere, it doesn't begin somewhere, it is, con it's a continuum. Mm -hmm. So what that basically means is that we have to feel and understand the disciplines which are engaged alongside us. We have to be very multidisciplinary in our approach because landscape can integrate everything together, being a setting. Mm -hmm. So it is naturally something which can be understood and influenced through multiple ways of thinking, multiple lenses. So like in the beginning, uh, uh, in, in her introduction, Nian talked about scales. Here I bring to you scales with, re re with respect to what kind of complexities these offer. So when we talk of something as, uh, as singular as a garden, I would not say small, it's, I, 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 I'm just saying singular for a certain reason. When we talk about something as singular as a garden, there, there is a piece of artistically designed land which is immersed in its setting. Sometimes the setting is an enclosure, which is locked from outside, which means that we are immersed in it. And sometimes it gives glimpses of what surrounds it. But nevertheless, the gamut of relationships that exist here is the relationships between the internal components of the garden and the way the land relates to its surroundings. But when we come to complexes, which are larger, then what happens? There we have a relationship which is between its built components, between the building and the outdoor, between the various spaces in the outdoors, forming some kind of a hierarchical relationship, as well as a relationship between the complex and the site on which it sits. Right. And when we come to a region, which is an entire large area, which is defined because of its regional peculiarities, there the occupational patterns create landscape, the topography creates landscape, our cities sit within that, and then there are cultural responses which are part of it. So the gamut of relationships become truly complex. And uh, another interesting thing to understand therefore by the last two slides that I spoke about is that landscape intersects various disciplines. It embodies issues and attitudes. On one hand, we, we may think that landscape is about earth sciences, geology, uh, the way topography is, soils, ecology, plants, botany, and all those life sciences. So earth sciences and life sciences are something which are part of our understanding when we look at landscape as a science. But then that science is only phenomena. What good would that serve if we are unable to create or weave philosophical and physical elements of this nature through our own theoretical premise to create an art, to include our, historic, our historical understanding of how we relate to nature and create a future of sustainability. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, all this is possible when we understand technically as architects, the way we construct landscape, the way technologies go into creating effects. When we talk of uh, water, when we talk of uh, the way we grade land, the kind of slopes that we create, it's all very, very technical. So from art to science to technique, everything needs to be joined together in our own way of understanding and thinking to be able to create landscape. So here is a, a set of uh, images which just says that how, so these are, you know, plans of some, some of our projects and what it, I have purposely removed references to buildings so that you would just understand it to begin with as a pattern. 
and you would say, okay, the pattern looks pretty. But where does, how do we think of these patterns? We think of these patterns because of the kind of inspirations that we have. Something may feel like a meandering river. Something may feel like patterns of uh, interwoven plants in a tropical forest. Something may be very, very artistically derived from a weaving pattern of, an, of a carpet. Something could be based on an orthogonal grid. But all of this depends on how inspired we are, how passionately we look at what is around. That determines what we create. So what we see on the left here is nature. And what we see on the right here is the inspired creations. This is what is important as a process, I feel, to become a landscape architect, to become a human being who can, who's worthy of feeling joy of creation. You know, that's that's what matters. Right. So I it, just have some, I just need to ask you something. Yeah. I was reading your article on landscaping and uh, somewhere you mentioned that landscaping is a design and plan of land setting so yes we understand that which is an alternate urbanism that's interesting because when we talk of urban areas when we, we are talking of building cities which means concrete buildings and perhaps of course bridges and roads and many of those things plus some waterways or water bodies here you are talking about landscaping being also an alternate urban or urbanism, a sense of what the whole city should be. And it talks about this is one space which conveys, uh, uh, it conveys sensitive, responsive, and responsible design. Yes. I want you to explain that a bit. Because okay. I really love so let's understand, way. let's understand our own human body, for example. Mm -hmm. Our human body has a structure. Now, what what lends the structure to the human body? It is essentially the skeleton system. Mm -hmm, yes. So the, our, our framework of bones is something that defines our shape. Traditionally speaking, cities, to begin with, you know, when when if you look at medieval towns, etc., then what we saw was that a town would recognize something, a, a historical setting would first of all recognize key points in topography which enable one to create a strong statement. So you would see a higher elevation, a little plateau somewhere, and that's where you would build your fortifications. Then you would have a city within it. Then you would also have certain surrounding high points like hills and all, and you would go and uh, put your temples there or anything of worship which you revel. And then uh, you would uh, feel that, okay, this is where the river flows by. Oh, so that, that's the most precious thing where I would need to uh, literally, you know, have, have access to water and therefore have my agriculture happening around that. And therefore I would not tamper with that land. Then wherever there would be uh, difficult slopes, rocky areas, you would leave that aside because you would have a general respect for it, not because of respect in general, mm -hmm. but also because you don't know how to deal with it. So initially, civilizations would be respectful to nature because of the awe of it, because of not knowing what it is all about and not having the capability to alter things. And then you would have the secular settlement uh, weaving in layers, sometimes based on uh, a, 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 a diagrammatic way of looking at how uh, we organize various castes into a city, traditionally speaking. Sometimes we would do it on the basis of occupation, sometimes uh, just on the basis of a Vastu diagram, which would uh, express how a city could be. But when city planning became a discipline, and we started to organize and create new cities, the only thing that was thought of as something that would, would give shape to a city was the roads, the movement networks. And the way the road pattern would be laid out would determine the areas where, which become the balance areas. And in that grid that then you would place uh, green areas somewhere and built areas somewhere. So if you look at uh, something like Manhattan, if you look at New York's plan, 
what do you see you see a dense grid and every grid is created because of the road intersections right and each of the little quadrant created by that grid are a set of buildings and then a few grids may be combined to create a large park the central park for example so okay. what we uh, and even if we look at uh, the uh, latin's city in uh, the, the, mm. what we call the latin city in new delhi which is uh, of course undergoing a lot of transformation now so there the central axis between the rashtrapati bhavan and the india gate is also a road which leads to a hexagon and then that hexagon uh, radiates out roads which uh, you know go into so roads were perceived as the primary way in which a city could be shaped coming back to human body now what runs inside this skeleton are systems mm. are networks networks of circulation networks of uh, where blood flows networks of how food gets uh, you know distributed in the body so there are organs and systems likewise the open space has the ability to serve as a lung or as a system which can provide shape to the city so for instance if we go to a, a large uh, region and we find that okay this topography is something which is worth preserving these are the water courses that we feel uh, are enriching the ground this is the way that that they flow now if we mark all that and create a green network around it then we would we would be left with large patches which would we, we could call developable and then we would lay out a system of buildings and movement to respond to that so ultimately we still get a city but it starts from the basics of using open space itself as a structuring element as a shaping element which is in tandem with natural processes so that we are able to live sustainably that is what it really meant right right sounds very you know it's so deeply thought out uh, so wonderful to know that our towns are designed with a lot of these things in mind and every actually every area of design should really be taking these three facts into consideration that they need to be sensitive they have to be responsive and responsible absolutely so sens- sensitivity really is about our own being understanding who we are right. what is my mission my role at this point in life why am i here and then based on that when we observe the phenomena around us then we are able to develop as sensitive people right and responses are nothing but our own feelings captured into some creative form for example a dancer would use dance as a medium to express a painter would use art as a medium somebody who writes an author would use uh, writing or poetry as a medium to express how he feels so the response is myriad and an architect therefore naturally the expression lies in observing and creating through lines something that will become alive one day so that is where the responsiveness comes into being and responsible naturally means that we are not merely artists who can feel joy at our own creation but we are responsible to the society and natural environment at large if we forget that point if we forget the relationship between i my society and my natural environment then i completely go berserk because i spoil the relationship between self and environment my realms of existence go berserk that's why upheavals happen you know right. so that's where uh, i that's why i called it the humble discipline right now the interesting point uh, that i now want to bring forth is that look we have been designing uh, buildings interiors and so on and so forth and we know what kind of components we use we use walls we use uh, 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 corridors we um, develop we divide space and create space by putting walls in corridors and creating rooms and uh, then we vary the scale of the rooms and the height that lies within it 
depending upon the kind of proportion we want. And uh, that's how we design. Mm -hmm. When we design landscape, our components are land, water, and vegetation. Mm -hmm. You have an image in front of you and you would be able to feel the fact that there are two enclosed and continuously flowing spaces which are there around the central large elevated mound. And if I was to say that all the elevated areas in this picture are like forms and all the depressed areas are like spaces, then one could relate this landscape to a building where we say that the volume inside the room is a space and the wall which encloses that space is a form. Likewise, when we go to a complex of buildings, then the, each building becomes a form and the intervening areas become space. So here is, a, here is an important thing to understand that therefore, Space can lies in uh, space lies in nature and can be created through natural elements. So, just throwing you uh, throwing off certain images on your mind to say that here is a space again. It has framing. It has a backdrop. It has a volume. Here are uh, uh, so as designers we know that points, lines, and masses are important. So here are examples of where landscape becomes a point, a single boulder, a large outcrop where a fort is situated, a single tree. These are all points. If you look at these, these appear as lines in landscape. It's nature, but it, it has lines within it. So if we learn from here, we can create lines. There are masses and masses enclose space. So, even in a tree, if you see, the right end of the picture shows what you see from outside. But there is a habit and a growth pattern of this tree which gives it this form. If the habit was different, it would grow different. So many trees look different from each other. Why? Because their habit of growth is different. Mm -hmm. This is if, if we are able to think architecturally like that for a tree, you really will feel very, very happy. And then you would understand why a people tree is so different from a devdar. Why is it so different from a, a fig? Why is it so different from a, a something like a, a mulberry? It's all because of the structure, the skeleton system of the tree itself. That is why this is how they appear. And when we talk of space, we can see that we can create different ratios, proportions, which will have its own emotional association. And like any other design, even when we do landscape design, so it would have virtues of framing, of direction, of focus, enclosure, expanse, backdrop, foreground, division, it would form a sequence, rhythm, balance, poise, so many things. So we always use these words when we describe design, isn't it? So that's what comes through continuously in any discipline of design. And landscape is no different. Mm -hmm. Now, Lastly, I would like to just uh, speak about a little bit about philosophically, what are my own underpinnings in my practice? What are the precepts that I hold when I design? Mm -hmm. So first and foremost is the fact that I look at landscape as a philosophy, the way that defines the, how we perceive, how we discern what is around us and how we respond to it and therefore create concepts. If that philosophical mind is not there, then a designer is null and void. That is what I strongly feel. The second precept is that we have to be stitched to the context. If we do something which does not respond to the context of uh, itself in space and time, both, whether physically or symbolically in our mind, then design would be very banal. It would not uh, bring about delight to, or a sense of experience to its users. This is where we are able to create value, where our thoughts can become places, where the art of making and the science of sustainability can come together. That's why don't we say uh, that Aristotelian thinking that design is more than purely a sum of its parts? Mm. Two plus two can be five. 
in her yeah. hair because of our thinking. Also, another precept being that design always derives from unique situations. Uh, I would like to say here that this word situation, I often use uh, just to say this, that, you know, uh, sometimes if we are insensitive, then we would say that here is a site. So we say, when we go and uh, start to get a project, we say there is a site. Mm -hmm. Now I am writing E in dotted. And then I cut that E and add U-A-T-I-O-N-S. Mm -hmm. So the site is a situation. What that essentially means is, the, when, when we talk to our friends, don't we say, hey, buddy, I'm stuck in this situation. Or... Mm -hmm. My situation is this, that at this point, so situation involves me, where I am, and what is the time. So if we look at our arenas where we need to work and think about it as immersed, as suspended in place and time, then we would be able to look at each thing as a situation and derive from there. That is a very, very crucial aspect. And what I strongly also believe in my own practice is that no matter how much you can do problem solving, unless you engage yourself artistically, you will not be able to become any worthwhile designer. Very often you see design also becomes a problem solving exercise. That here is a brief, these are the issues, now go ahead and connect the dots. That's that's just that's something that doesn't have a symbolic meaning. The delight comes when we are able to look at it as art. And lastly, I always feel that today is a new day, and my best needs to come. So whatever you know, a project takes a landscape project takes sometimes five to seven years to complete. But by the time we have grown. And then we can't say, oh, that was something that I really loved. By that time, something else awaits its birth. So coming back to just showing you a little bit of uh, some of our works and not speaking about them. So one way could have been, you, you may have met uh, people who would present their projects, project by project. What I've done here is I've just said that there are themes. So here are a few projects which describe that whatever we create inside has a relationship to what is outside. So outside meaning outside our sight. Mm -hmm. So we are able to engage with what is outside and therefore make what we are designing worthwhile by including or borrowing from its surroundings. Sometimes if there is nothing to borrow, we just do a still water body and let the buildings reflect in themselves or the sky reflect itself. Mm. It's so wonderful. Mm. Landscape can also be a traverse. It can be a journey. Mm -hmm. We can design the way we move through places. You may have recognized some of this like the cyber city or the uh, aero city where you have uh, that food court under the bridge uh, near the airport. So these are all examples of creating multiple experiences of traverse. Sometimes we design thinking about our cultural aesthetic and celebrate our rootedness in history. So uh, we, we, we try to reinterpret historic forms into our new way of thinking. If you look at this image, which is the second image, uh, very interestingly, so it's just a simple market complex, which has a lower ground floor and an upper ground floor. Mm -hmm. The lower ground floor always feels that, oh, my visibility is less. So it just becomes, uh, it, it sells at a lower rate. In this complex, what we did was we created these ghats as though we are descending on and getting into a river. And this cultural idea of stepping made the lower ground shops so nicely visible that it certainly enhanced their price. So uh, then what about stylizing nature and its patterns itself? So if you look at the geometries of these designs that I'm showing you, these are inspirations from nature, how a river flows, how a hill is, what do trees do, and that's how we create. 
in fact even the uh, picture that you see on the bottom left and the illustrations that you see by the side of it on the right these are explain these are explorations of how a river would flow through rapids and cascades with boulders and then come down into a delta finally also in most works we should find an opportunity to be able to sculpt land and not just simply make a pattern on a flat ground sculpting land is the starting point of creating landscape and as i said that it is a cusp of so many disciplines so sometimes you don't know where the interior ends where the building begins where the landscape ends and the, so it's all merged together so some of these projects that you see here like the pearl academy of fashion where uh, you see all the uh, right. you know the underbelly itself as a as a as a place to interact for students and the sky visible uh, through the courtyard you see an amphitheater here in the north south university in dhaka where uh, the building level itself two floors are connected by such steps so these become seating spaces for students then we have thematical way of looking at urbanism itself to give identity to districts or precincts within the city we have aspirational idea in landscape sometimes we evoke luxury and uh, create a lifestyle out of that so these are residential condominiums uh, that you see here landscape also is about creating or thinking about it as a metaphor as a as a symbol of something that symbolic idea gives it the dualism something that you can feel proud about we also have landscape in the interior so these are uh, the airports that we've uh, been designing so here you see that in the indoor environment how a sense of a garden is created mm -hmm. and landscape can sometimes be an educational aid too so if you're designing a school can the amphitheater tell you how what trigonometry is can you learn geometry and mathematics through the steps that you make mm -hmm. so at the end i would say that we have to challenge conceptions and rebuild our relationship with nature ecology and setting and then create what we call landscape i think that is all that i would like to uh, share from my side now i would like to interact with you all and uh, really you know uh, take this forward so first of all sunit fantastic i mean i i think uh, thank you for sharing your philosophy because that is ultimately how we would relate to you you know all the participants they start understanding what how you worked how you designed and based on that your perspective on what landscape design is so thank you for that we thank have so of course a lot of questions for you uh, some of them will refer back to the slides but i think are you okay if i take a 30 second break oh please do please do thank you so much right um so guys uh, it's about i think a, a lot of our participants probably know and hear a lot about architecture interior design and we have also in our webinar series invited many of them to talk about their work uh, this is the first time we look we considered the outside of the space uh, and wanted to figure out how is it looked at by designers themselves you know uh, the architects who are of course uh, designing the building but also an interior designer who would be looking at design of the space and of course the view of the space through the window outside now when when the designers i i would think all the designers involved have to ensure such a seamless uh, uh, conceptual coming together of three spaces it really is not so uh, it's not just you know uh, by the flipping of a coin that you get these ideas i was talking about uh, sunit while you were gone i was just saying that you know designing a building the architectural structure the interior which is a space inside and the viewer who's going to look at the landscape outside you know for all these three spaces to relate together Yes. perhaps is being done by three different groups or three different mentalities 
or of course it can be done by one one pers one group of people working together and to put it together like i said seamlessly you know with uh, and just flowing one into the other is abs a different is an experience everybody wants to have and perhaps this is what we want to give to our clients so so my first question to you would be if when you are designing in all your projects that I've seen, you know, you have been sort of dabbling as an architect. You have also been looking at landscaping, whether in, inside the building or outside. Uh, how do you go about it? Do you take inspiration from the outside landscape to design your building and then the interior? Or how do you relate these three different aspects? See, uh, there are two uh, angles in this, which I would like to uh, talk about. One is the fact that uh, actually it all boils down to one only. So, mm -hmm. And that is uh, a respect and an understanding or empathetic view towards multidisciplinarity. Right. If we understand and give room to multiple thinking, then integration will never be a problem. Right. So uh, what often happens is uh, today we are in an age of multi-speciality, especially mm -hmm. when you look at the medical science, you go to a cardiologist, he will do everything possible to uh, enrich your heart, but you won't know when your kidneys give away. Mm -hmm. and, prob and sometimes when you go to a nephrologist, he would say that, oh, the blood pressure medicine that has been given to you is not right for your kidneys. <laughs> but people who are stuck in their own uh, little rooms of thought right. and not looking at things holistically are often more of a problem than a, than, than a joy or a solution. Right. And likewise, even uh, another thing I would like to say here is that a lot of it begins from just because I talked of medical science, that is why I'm taking this additional uh, angle here. You see, you must have gone to doctors who would ask you what is wrong and then they would prescribe 20 tests and you would go and get all that done. And then one report after another would be looked at, collated, and then something found out. Mm -hmm. Likewise, if we look at us as designers, and especially students in schools, what we do is uh, the first part of our, uh, any beginning of a semester is about site analysis. It is about collecting data and information and we have become experts at surfing the net and plonking the entire screen with uh, you know thousands of images and data. And then all this analysis ultimately leads to paralysis and suddenly, one fine day we are said, uh, uh, we are told that, okay, now today is your concept design submission and we don't know where we are. Mm. So why does this happen? It is because we relied only on analysis, but beyond analysis, there is something called instinct. Same. Correct. So Correct. when we look at instinct and have a first principle approach to uh, thinking, then analysis becomes an aid rather than something which is a tool to achieve something. So an aid means that we already have an idea. Now we want to prove it through the analytical framework rather than use the analysis to think that what should my framework be. All right. So that brings about some way of being proactive in conceptualizing. Now, as far as your question about the integration is concerned, so as I said, this respect about the fact that what is ultimately the vision of all of the people in the uh, consortium who are dealing with various disciplines, what is their end goal? So sometimes in certain projects, like uh, we, we, we are recently, do, uh, we are currently doing a uh, a temple complex where there are four temples mm -hmm. and uh, the architect is designing the temples and uh, we are uh, taking care of the outdoors. Now, uh, naturally, 
it was unthinkable at that time when we went with our scheme and then you know one of the uh, one of the uh, people in that office they came back and he came back and told me i never knew that landscape could create a new way of organizing the entire site i could never have pictured that and i had always thought that we've given you these temples now you will fill the spaces between them mm. so in some projects landscape takes precedence where building is an object in landscape right. while in some others for example if you are doing a city hotel it's a highly built complex mm -hmm. it has column grids mm -hmm. it has a structural system landscape must respect that and therefore uh, be a continuum to the experience that is created by the built volume right and likewise when we talk about interior and landscape i think that that indoor outdoor continuum is so wonderful to work on mm -hmm. where sometimes even even you know a simple thing like a bathroom may have one of the walls detached mm. with a covering from the top of glass and you have light coming in and you have nature there and you you create a feeling of being inside and outside now the pattern of that nature outside will naturally be determined by the way the layout of the toilet inside is mm. isn't it so if i have a back of a wc sitting against that then i would not do it it's right. only when I, so there is a lot of seamlessness that is required right. in our mind first and foremost right. we get constricted because our thinking is so uh, so much in the little uh, cubby holes that we live in you know there's so much to talk on this subject i think we need to have another webinar <laughs> i was just thinking I, i there are a lot of questions myself Uh, which i would of course like to put forth first but then we have a comment here from saran bhartia and uh, he says can we say that it is the art of creating a conscious blend as a whole which in a way what is what what you are talking about including everything where tangible and intangible entities come together with human design consciousness expressing ultimate unity uh really in many sense he's talking about sorry i don't know if it's he or she uh, forgive me but but i really like what you're conveying that uh, whether it's tangible intangible coming together forming a unity and that is exactly what sunith is talking about you know three different spaces it could be many more integrating seamlessly in many ways i think is really bringing about that the the wholesomeness of the design and i think all designers need to fulfill that whether you make a product or whether you're designing buildings or whether you're designing urban spaces yes thank you saran that was really a nice comment that was a very insightful and it has some very very uh, very very uh, i should say uh, key words there for example the just conscious when he says conscious blend conscious is a very very important key Absolutely. word and i think somewhere you have just got and you have got just this macro view in such a short span of time so i must say that you really have a very sharp <laughs> presence over here in this uh, in this webinar uh, so there are some more questions which i'm going to put forward to you is that are you ready so yes yes Sure. Uh, which are the three important qualities that landscape architects need to build up their practice and to be able to succeed in their career? Uh, okay, uh, there are various approaches today to landscape architecture, and I would talk of two extreme approaches first, which and these are completely my views. So. Uh, i hold on to my views and i don't uh, mean to uh, you know uh, right. demean any other uh, view based on that so when when you in the beginning you said that there is something called uh, from my article when you were reading you said there is something called a garden and something called landscape and something called nature nature correct now if if i look at what is a garden 
then garden is typically a two dimensional way of looking at creating a pattern that means somebody may think that design is about pattern making mm. which means that it would lose its three dimensionality to a large extent and we would start to think only in a plan mm. and forget about the fact that there is an experience which is part of it like vitruvius gave us the, these treatises on architecture and he says that there are three things which are important first is stability which means the way to hold things the second is functionality which is about serving the needs and the third is very importantly delight right. and if delight is missing then the first two are nothing so if we look at the garden way of landscape then we would just become two dimensional artists mm -hmm. and the other extreme is going to the other end where today you would see i don't want to give a percentage but it's a huge percentage of landscape architects and people involved in the discipline for whom landscape is about storm water management ecological restoration afforestation soil stabilization etc 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 which means that the all the problems that the earth is facing today become something that is addressed to a landscape architect to say that now solve it and landscape architects themselves yes they are responsible towards it but that alone cannot create a design that would simply be solving issues and problems and why people are rushing on this because it makes big headlines when you say that you uh, you know today today uh, climate change is something which is is for real mm. so when you engage with it you can make headlines naturally correct but i am so i am saying that pattern making is important mm. and respecting nature and working with it is important but landscape is neither of the two it is first and foremost recognizing the art of creating something based on nature and pattern because nature has taught us that it has processes within it and those processes become patterns so the first quality that we need i think as a uh, to be a successful practice is to have a strong touch with our creative self where our whole uh, essence lies then of course what you need to do is have practically speaking degree in landscape architecture which is presently a masters degree in india and for that ideally you should do a do a degree a bachelor's degree in architecture because otherwise understanding holistically would be very difficult yeah. so of course planners are also permitted to uh, become landscape architects and uh, at some time it was also botanists and geographers who were allowed to become but it becomes very difficult to comprehend the entirety of uh, the space you know. yeah so uh, from that uh, perspective yes that degree is very important the third is a uh, secret the secret is that have good relationships with architects otherwise you won't get work <laughs> that's a practical tip <laughs> absolutely so uh, so 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 an architect has to go into the world to unknown personalities to get projects right but landscape architects work is a bit simpler because he's already connected to the discipline of architecture and you get your introduction there so i have tried to answer this question in a uh, philosophy in humor and practicality no oh, wonderful i hope sir. that since giving so since you are giving uh, sharing with us a lot of this internal information uh, there's another question about what are the challenges landscape architects face today would you i don't know if there are challenges i'm sure it's not so hunky dory or not so easy any way to do to be in any field 
Well, and living is a challenge. Living is itself uh, a challenge. So uh, any endeavor of life is a challenge, and landscape architecture is no uh, no but way. But would you say something about sustainability? Because you did mention it in the passing, but I would like you to tell yeah. a little bit on that. Yes. So uh, you see. as i said in my presentation that the components that compose landscape are land water and vegetation mm -hmm. therefore if we do not understand the processes involved with these because these are living media we will make a terrible mistake mm -hmm. so sustainability in that sense is not a discipline it in itself it is a way of thinking sustainability is about having a way of life which is endowed with this uh, responsiveness and responsibility so uh, many times we see of course today sustainability is also looked at, at as a discipline but i think that is again a result of that super specialization uh, syndrome that mm -hmm. society has but i think that if you are not sustainable in your work then you have failed because if your work is ultimately ruining nature and it is spoiling lives then there is no point in doing that because you are looking at it at a in a very short sighted manner and i for sure believe in uh, uh, you know cyclicity of life so even if you think in your lifetime it would ha not happen you will come back as a child again okay <laughs> so there is no escape so sustainability is a virtue which we have to okay. adopt if we have to live in this world and let live so living and letting somebody to live means that our actions have to be sustainable in every which way and design is no exception absolutely in landscape because land water and vegetation are involved i repeat here if we do not understand the processes that when water flows what does it carry with it mm. when water flows how does it erode what is the meaning of sedimentation mm. what is the meaning of aeration as water flows what happens when it gets stagnated right likewise if we know that there is a large tree with a huge canopy we should understand that there is only something that can grow under it not grass mm. something probably different if we'll try to grow grass under a tree we'll water it 10 times a day and we'll just spend resources so we have to understand the processes of nature to be able to come up with something that we can uh, call respectful yeah well wonderful i mean a lot of the things you're talking about is right behind my house and i talk about the land and the grass doesn't grow there so these things hit home you know it's 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 around us and we better start paying a little attention so we'll meet over dinner to look at your lawn <laughs> lovely but uh, sunid one last question because i know we've stretched a little beyond but this is very important even for the participants who are viewing us you showed you talked a lot about landscaping in scale you know the scale of the architecture and the scale of landscape and you showed a whole lot of visuals where there are these big buildings even if they are older monuments and then you had landscaping as gardens like the mughal gardens and many of those would that uh, an expertise in that be very different from an expertise that is required to have landscaping inside a building like what you showed at airports or for things like the rock garden in japanese architecture you know these are very small areas but they artistically convey a lot of things whereas the landscaping outside has a different um, forms of uh, they visually appear different and give different pleasures i guess what do you uh, could you tell us about a little bit about that do you need to be very specialized differently yeah no no there is nothing of uh, nothing in terms of specialization it is a temperamental issue actually so as a designer we uh, our temperaments are different mm -hmm. some are very good at envisioning larger homes and therefore giving a vision to shape something uh, uh, something very wholesome mm -hmm. 
but the detail in it would be something that they would probably not be good at mm-hmm. and their whole mind works in that kind of a, at that kind of a scale then there would be somebody who can uh, who if you ask that oh i i need this kind of a door he would start from the keyhole and the handle yeah and he would believe that that detail is something which will help me to make a statement through this door right. so a uh, somebody who's involved with that scale and that kind of a uh, uh, it is that detailing is indispensable to that you know mm-hmm. so just like there is a contradiction between art and science sometimes so temperamentally we are of different uh, uh, you know uh, our our minds go into different directions and it is very rare to find people who are able to uh, uh, be adept at a seamlessness of all scales right so if we really struggle towards that or if we at least uh, practically speaking in our organizations where we engage with our consultancy we must have a blend of such people right because without that it just won't work out right mm-hmm. wow thank you i think that was that's an answer many of our students and practitioners would be seeking uh, i'd like to thank you, you know but ultimately if beauty is something that you care for then you would be able to bring it about at any scale at any level that's the important thing so discerning what is uh, what one calls uh, beauty and knowing that beauty is to a sense subjective right but beauty is not aesthetics beauty is inner and outer mm. so that's why i said the philosophy the thought the symbolism behind what you design and its physical appearance or manifestation both together come uh into creating a wholesome peace so that inner and outer beauty is important yeah. right thank you very much sunit that was it was really really informative very useful i i've become a little richer now with some more information uh thank you on behalf of all my participants our college and we are here to we hope we'll be in touch and i yes. i can i took in a lot there is still a lot that we can discuss but i know we are running out of time um, thank you all very much um we bring this to you from js institute of design please visit our website and if you have any suggestions for the coming up seminars uh, do feel free to get in touch with us thank you once again sunit and thank you team you have all done a good job uh, getting that webinar up and technically sound so bye bye and, and uh, i again offer my gratitude to all of you to uh, to bring together this platform and i'm sure this uh, these humble steps go a long way to uh, really inform the world of design and uh, help so many of us to uh, share uh, our experiences and therefore become richer thank you so much right oh uh, there is a uh, well ashish sir varma uh, ashish varma says respected sir a fantastic session about landscape design uh, and i'll just read out the idea of sustainability in each and every domain on this planet is a must we all are a part of vicious cycle at city level now we need to know we na- we need to focus on nature based solutions so very rightly said ashish uh, i'm sure sunit's uh, uh, philosophy on the way he works and with the field that he talks about this is going to be very inspirational for us thank you for your kind words ashish and your insight thank you and saran as well that's a cool comment his he, that's another <laughs> one so sunit you have a lot of good following <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> okay bye bye good night everybody good night thank you